Do you ever feel like the church is maybe getting a little too political these days? If so, then today's gospel may be just the thing for you. It begins with our Lord Jesus deftly avoiding a rhetorical trap set for him by some very strange bedfellows, the Pharisees and the Herodians. The Christ then counters them with a seemingly simple object lesson. Show me the coin used for the tax, Christ commands, and they totally fall for it. After they bring him the coin and correctly identify the image engraved upon the coin as that of the emperor, our ever quotable Christ says something to them that fans and followers and friends and even foes of Jesus have remembered ever since. In the old King James, render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. Jesus does something there that's very easy to miss, at least at first. The plain understanding, the plain reading of Christ's command is that there are certain things, presumably worldly things, that belong to the emperor and everything the emperor represents. And there are other things, presumably spiritual things, that properly belong to God. It's hard for an American to hear Christ's command and not think of our own tradition of separation of church and state. And so with Christ's render unto Caesar on one shoulder and America's separation of church and state on the other, it doesn't take long for the average American Christian to arrive at the same conclusion as singer-songwriter Janice Ian. She famously said, two people you should never trust, a religious leader who tells you how to vote and a politician who tells you how to pray. That's good, right? But. Just as soon as we've compartmentalized our politics and economics on the one hand and our religion and morality on the other in a way that somehow feels reasonable or respectable to us, there's something about Christ's command that begins to tickle in the back of our mind. Render therefore unto Caesar the things which are Caesar's and unto God the things that are God's. That tickle, sooner or later, takes the form of a question. Some of us have been wrestling with this question and its implications for a long time. For some of us, this question will feel like a new one. But whenever it comes to us, the question goes a little something like this. What exactly does not belong to the God who creates, redeems, and makes holy everyone and everything out of pure parental and divine goodness and mercy without any merit or worthiness of mine at all. What isn't God's? The answer to that question seems pretty straightforward. It's all God's. And not just originally or ultimately. It's all God's, and the God revealed to us in Jesus and ever-present in the Spirit is no absentee landlord, no clockmaker God. It's all God's. And we human beings as individuals and as institutions are but stewards of God's things, and that for only a brief time. And over time, sometimes very gradually, and sometimes very suddenly, God transforms the way we think about or feel about or talk about or otherwise interact with God's things. And that shouldn't come as any surprise to those of us who believe that love changes people. And when God brings about that change, 
God seems to do so in just such a way that we are better able to appreciate two things. First, we're able to better notice and honor God's handiwork in the creation around us. Second, we are better able to notice and honor God's own divine image engraved upon our neighbor. So, politics, economics, human rights, the arts and entertainment, sports, education, science, medicine, all those things that we normally think of as belonging to the worldly category, God means to transform all of those things, which are God's things, or are our way of interacting with God's things. God means to transform all of those things by means of God's grace and for the purposes of God's grace. God means to transform all of those things in a way that is so gentle and beautiful and complete that it will be shocking to liberals and conservatives alike. And history is just chock full of examples of God doing exactly this. For example, it is worth noting that just 300 or so years after the moment described in today's gospel, the successor to the emperor whose image was engraved upon that denarius they handed to Jesus was himself baptized into Christ. It's all God's, even the emperor, but that's a whole nother sermon. So, I totally get it if it feels like maybe church is getting a little too political these days. I really do. The church has for so many years now followed polite society's old rule that you never talk about money, sex, or politics. And so now anytime we teach or pray or talk about something that actually touches on human life, it's going to feel like God is getting in our business. It's going to maybe feel a little political. So as your pastor and your sibling in Christ, I am asking you to prayerfully consider the outrageous possibility that your God is on the move to transform the world, the human family, the church, you and me. And God gets to do all of that because we are, it's all God's. In the spirit of Jesus, amen.